Happy 2018, everyone. The best thing about a new year is that we are now one year closer to Jesus' return. Amen? That is something to look forward to. I'm very excited about that. You know, there's a number of things that I want to bring to your attention, almost all of which can be found in the bulletin. First of all, if you ordered a 2018 devotional, those books are here. They are simply waiting for you in the church office. They have your name on them. All you need to do is drop in and pick it up. We are going to be having potluck next Sabbath, a good time to be had by all, immediately following second service, so bring your favorite vegetarian dish to share. Young adults, there is going to be a retreat for you called Immersion, February 23rd through the 25th. If you'd like more information on that, you can talk to our uh, conference youth director, Edward Martone, or you can check it out online. The information is listed there. A couple of announcements from your youth pastor. January 13 at 6 p.m. Do you ever wonder what your children are learning in Sabbath school? If you fall into that category, please come on January 13th, 6 p.m. This is going to be an opportunity for parents and Sabbath school teachers to get to know each other and to discuss what it is they're discussing without you there. So you can get the inside scoop. Make sure you're there January 13th. It's going to be a lot of fun and good food. January 27th is called Unique and Minute to Win It Game Night for 6th through 12th grade students. Starting at 4 p.m., the teenagers are going to take some time to get to know what their spiritual gifts are. We want to plug them in and make sure they know what those gifts are and that they're using them right here in our church. Following that, there will be dinner. Following that will be Minute to Win It games, so it's going to be a very good time. Last but not least, folks, I want to draw your attention to the Health Expo that's going to be taking place at the Worthington Mall on January 11th. It is the new year. There are lots of people thinking about their health right now. There is perhaps no better time for us as Adventists to put our best foot forward with our Adventist health message and talk to people about their health. We have got an incredible wealth of knowledge and information that we are going to share. There's going to be health screenings uh, January 11th, 12 to 6, and if you would like to get into that, involved in that, rather, uh, just contact Marge Hay, and she would be happy to plug you in. Happy New Year. Gary, you thought you'd get away without singing with us, didn't you? <laughs> Gary's back from Florida. I'm sure it's for a visit. Gary, come on up. You know this, you know this call to worship. Come on up. <laughs> come on, Gary. <laughs> You've done this, we've done this many times.
just wanted to let you know you have to open your hymn books because uh, we have a problem with our computer. So grab the hymn books. Let's stand together. Number 75, number 75, in your hymnals. <clears throat> There's the wonder of sunset at evening, the wonder at sunrise I see, but the wonder of wonders that Is the wonder that God loves me. Oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me. Oh, the you to stand or, or sit or kneel as we as we have our congregational prayer this morning our gracious Heavenly Father thank you for this day thank you that we are all here today and that we have within us that breath that goes all the way back to when you took the clay and the earth and the Bible says you formed the first man and you breathed into him the breath of life and Lord, if, if for nothing else we come today to acknowledge you as our creator and to thank you for the life that we have here on this earth. Lord, many times we come to a new year and we think of what has been in the past and what lies ahead. And Lord, maybe because we're at the beginning of a new year, we think of the story of Jeremiah who went to the prophet and the prophet made one, uh, the potter, the potter, and the potter made one, one shape and then when that didn't work out, he made another shape and we think, Lord, we want to be in your hands and make us who you would be to the people around us and we think primarily of those who are nearest and dearest to us, to our families. Brothers, sisters, parents, children, cousins, uncles, however we're related. And then 
people we meet regularly, people at work that we associate with. And Lord, just as the potter had plans for what he was making, we know you have plans for us, and we pray that in 2018, those plans will be worked out in our lives. And so, Lord, we come here today to worship you. We come here to praise you. We come here to consecrate our beings to you is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Deacons, come on, come on up to the front, please, as we're getting ready to pick up the offering. Every once in a while, this type of news story catches my attention, and maybe it has caught yours too, and maybe church is the last place you expected to hear it, but here goes. So the big jackpots for Powerball and Mega Millions are roughly at half a billion dollars each. So if you were to win big on both, you, you, you'd be the owner of about a billion dollars. Now, when you come to church, you should always hear something that's helpful. So here it is. Don't, don't buy a lottery ticket, okay? <laughs> you got that? <laughs> uh, um, but I was thinking, certainly if you had a billion dollars, you could have anything that money could buy. And you guys know what a billion is, right? It's a thousand millions, and a million is a thousand thousands. So um, I'm not even sure if the concept of a billion existed in biblical times. Maybe somebody can fill me in, in on that later. But instead of, instead of that message, I have a different message for you. And this goes way back. As a matter of fact, it goes back to a book in the Old Testament where God said, bring all the tithes and I'll add and offerings into the storehouse. And then he said, you know what? I'm going to open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing for you. Because you see, you win money, it's impersonal. But God says, I'm going to pour out a blessing for you that you will not have enough room to receive it. So I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you got to hear that message. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for what you have given to us. And if we look into our lives, we would already say, you have already opened the windows of heaven and poured out your blessing into our lives. And Lord, we come as a response of recognition of your ownership of everything, and our response to your great love to us is to give just a small portion of that which you've entrusted to us. Our prayer in Jesus' name, amen.
Okay, it is time for the children's story. So all of you kids come on down and take a seat. And I have a story to tell you. And all of you folks who are out there listening, remember that now at the end of our children's stories, we pass out these bu buckets here to come around and shake y'all down. So have your money ready to give to the kids when they come running back to get it. Hi. So while you guys are all coming down, come on, come on. I'll tell you, Chappie sent me a text and she said, can you tell a children's story this week? And I thought and thought and tried to figure out a story I could tell and I came up with one and I said, okay, I got one. Yeah, I'll do it. Come on over here, you guys. Come on over here. I'm gonna show you some pictures. So sit on over here a little bit closer. There you go. So then I got a text from her again. And she said, oh, by the way, it's communion. So, you know, two or three minutes. So <laughs> I'm going to talk really fast, all right, to tell you guys a story. Thank you for coming down here. How many of you, raise your hand, if you have ever fished before? If you have ever gone fishing? You've gone fishing? You've gone fishing? Yeah? Anybody else? You've never? Yeah? Gone fishing? Does it sound like fun? Yeah? Did you ever catch anything when you went fishing? You caught something? That's really exciting when you catch something, isn't it? Well, I'm going to tell you a story about when I went fishing with my husband, Phil. Wave hi, Phil. That's my husband. We were in Hawaii, and we went fishing out, way out in the water, way, way, way out in the water to where you couldn't even see land anymore. We were so far out. And when you fish in deep water like that, you throw the lines out and then the boat keeps going so that the line is really, really, really far away. So when you caught a fish, for you guys who said you caught one, did it take a really long time to reel it in? Did it take a really long time or was it kind of quick? You just had to reel a few times. Don't remember? Okay, that's all right. So where I was, we were fishing for big fish, not little ones that you just reel up over the side of the boat or on the dock or maybe on land, right? But big, big fishes. So when you get one, you have to sit down in this special chair and you strap yourself into the chair. Why do you think I might have had to strap myself into the chair? That's right, say that again. Because you would fall in the water. Yes, exactly. Because if I did catch a really big fish, it might pull me right over the side of the boat. If I got so excited I forgot to let go of the pole, right? It might just pull me right over like that on the side of the boat. You, it would, might be a shark. Yeah, yeah I could have caught a shark, right? Well, we were out in the water for a really long time. And to keep it short, it was several hours. We were falling asleep. We were bored. We didn't catch any fish. We were so bored. And we spent a lot of money to go out on this big boat to go fishing. And so we thought, oh, no. We spent all this money for nothing just to take a nap out in the water. So finally, we heard... Hit, And that's what the captain says when we get a bite on one of the lines that are out there. So I jumped up and we had already decided, because it was kind of our late honeymoon, that I got to go first. That the first bite we got got to be me. So I jumped in that chair and I strapped myself in and I grabbed hold of the reel. And the fish was really far out there. And the captain says, Real, 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 because who's in charge on a boat? The captain, right? So he says, real, 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 and I was really so fast. Oh, so fast. It was taking forever. I couldn't even see the fish anywhere. And I was reeling, reeling, reeling. And then he'd say, stop. And I would stop. And he'd say, release. And I'd release it. And then he'd say, reel again. And I would reel, 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 reel. And remember I said we were out in the middle of the ocean and we couldn't see anything. There was no land. There was only us except for one thing, a weather buoy. 
These are the big floating things they put out in the ocean so that scientists and weathermen can know how high the waves are and how strong the wind is blowing. And my fish got caught around a weather buoy in the middle of the ocean. What are the odds of that happening? Lottery odds, that's what. That's the odds of that happening. So the captain said, stop, and I stopped. Because if he was caught around there, the, the hook that was in his mouth might just rip off, right? And then I'd lose it. And there was a boy who he was called the deck hand. And he said, I see it, I'm gonna jump into the water and I'm gonna get it, because he really wanted me to get that fish. He knew how much I wanted it. And the captain said, no, you're not thinking. If that fish is injured or it might bleed, and then if it bleeds, what's gonna happen? What's gonna come to get my fish? A shark, right? And if he was in the water when that happened, that would not be good. So he listened to what the captain said and he stopped and he didn't go in. Now, that went on for what seemed like, I don't know, eight or nine hours. That was about half an hour, but it seemed like a lot. My hand was hurting so bad, he would drive the boat around the buoy and I'd reel, 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 and then he'd say, no, let it go. And then I'd have to reel, reel, reel. And my hand got so tired, I switched to my left hand because I thought, oh no, I'm gonna lose the fish. I'll reel with my left hand. And he said, get your left hand off of that reel. He yelled at me. And he said, you use your right hand. So I stopped and I listened and I used my right hand. And at the end of it all, after all this time, I caught the fish. I caught a 24 pound mahi mahi is what they're called. Yeah, and here's a picture of it. And this is the deck hand that wanted to jump in. Right there at the top. That's a picture. So if you stood this fish up and its mouth was on the floor with me, it would stand about this tall. It was really, really big, that fish. It was really big. And afterwards, when I caught it, the captain told me, see it up there? Okay. It's a really big fish, right? 24 pounds. 20 inches long, it's even longer than that, yeah. So after all of that, the captain told me something. He said, when we snag fish, women are able to bring them in, to reel them all the way in, way better than men. And I said, what? But men are stronger. They should be able to do better than, than a woman because I felt really bad. I was getting so sore and tired. And he said, no, women do better. And this is why women will listen to the captain. <laughs> they'll listen. When the captain says, stop, they'll stop. When the captain says, get your left hand off of there, they'll take their left hand off of there, right? And that's why, because the captain is the one who's in charge, and the captain is the one who's smart and knows everything about fishing. So if we listen, instead of maybe going, no, I almost got it, I'm bringing it in, and then you lose it, right? So it's really important that we listen to the people who know more than us, right? Captains, teachers, parents, pastors, it's very important that we listen and be obedient. Today we have communion, and most of you probably saw that we do foot washing, right? And that seems a little strange sometimes. Why do we wash each other's feet? And there's reasons, and you'll learn about them if you haven't already, but the most important thing to remember is that we do this to be obedient. We do this because Jesus told us to, and even when we don't understand it, that's enough. Just that he told us is enough. Okay? Let's close our eyes. Does anyone want to say a prayer? First while we're here? Okay, let's say a quick prayer for today. God, thank you for all that you did for us. Thank you for protecting and respecting us. And thank you for 
And thank you for giving us what we have now. Amen. Amen. That was wonderful. Now, you guys, come and get your buckets and go see how full you can get them. There we go. Separate them. There we go. Whoops. Oh, my goodness. You'd think they were filled with candy or something. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Get in there. There you go. Okay, now go around. Tell people to fill them up. Oh, we got to go this way too. Do you want to go up there and get people in the choir? Good job. Oh, go back there. There's more. Back there. There you go. Wave your hand if you have more. Thank you, kids, hand. for taking the offerings from the choir. And if you see some money floating from the top of the balcony, this is also for you. Just get at that. Yeah, some are uh, dropping. Do you want me to get it for you? And wonderful job uh, with this fishing story, uh, Sarah. I love the story. <laughs> I'm envious. Uh, so I would like, uh, before you go to your seat, Sarah, would you please join me just here for a minute? I have uh, the principal of our school, Mrs. Green, who would like to say a few words for you. I am not. <laughs> I just wanted to thank Sarah publicly for the work that she did with us for our Christmas play. I didn't get to do it the night of, and I thought it was really important that I did it today before too much time went by. So, Sarah, because I appreciate you. Thank you. And I really do. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> By the way, uh, Sarah is teaching our, our children in our school sign language so that they will, will be able to communicate with people who for some reason cannot hear and understand what we say. So thank you, Sarah, and thank you, kids. I see your buckets are full. That's great. Uh, and all this money are going to go to help uh, our Seventh-day Adventist education in our school and in our daycare.
thank you choir and happy new year and happy sabbath well let's try it again happy sabbath and a happy new year okay that's better for those of you who are already uh, celebrating their birthday happy birthday i know that uh, uh gary is here on purpose cassandra has a uh, birthday today so happy birthday casey and if anyone else has had a birthday already in these uh, six days of the new year happy birthday to you too I would like to ask you, uh, friends, uh, to sing with me a prayer before we begin. So please join me. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary, Lord, for you. Let's try it one more time. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy. Tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Heavenly Father, you heard the prayer of your people to be a holy place for your divine presence. So we, we invite you, Lord, in this new year to fulfill this uh, prayer and promise and bless us today as we contemplate your word to hear your voice. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Friends, it's again this time of the year when we make promises to ourselves and sometimes to other people and to God that we are not going to be the same. We look back in the 2017 and we realize that we made the same New Times, uh, New Year's resolution that we are making this year. We want to be smarter, slimmer, healthier, richer, happier. And yet, strangely enough, 360 days from now, we are going to realize that the majority of us have, has not reached this goal. As a matter of fact, if you have made already some New Year's resolution, according to Forbes magazine, by the end of this month, one third of us have, have already, would have been already broken this New Year's resolution. And 92%, 360 days from now, are going to look back disappointed at the results or lack thereof of their New Year's resolutions. For some reason, we love making new beginnings, but we end up with the same old endings what's wrong with this picture today I would like to give Jesus the opportunity to tell us to preach to us I'm gonna preach uh, one of his sermons I would like Jesus to tell us why our New Year's resolutions fail and how to make them lasting how to make them successful so I've titled my message today making new year's what do you notice that i've changed one letter so what is it new year's what okay well please grab your bibles and open them to luke chapter 5 verses 36 through 39 we're going to listen to a very short sermon of jesus and yet powerful sermon of jesus by the way, uh, as you are flipping the pages or you're browsing through your electronic devices to find 
Luke chapter 5. I would like to ask you, how many of you would like Jesus to be the lead pastor of Worthington Seventh-day Adventist Church? Okay. Those of you who do not like Jesus to be a lead pastor, you, you like me, okay? You're not going to replace me. Uh, no, uh, joking aside, I would love to have Jesus as a lead pastor of Worthington Seventh-day Adventist Church. Yet, may I tell you something? If he were the lead pastor of Worthington Seventh-day Adventist Church, what would have happened? Most of you are going to be bitterly disappointed. And you say, oh, that, that cannot be. Well, it is, it is true. Jesus has a very strange preaching style. Yeah, he is. He does. Jesus' style is unmatched in the, in the New Testament and in the Old Testament in the Bible. It's a very strange style because after the majority of his sermons, even his disciples, not to mention about the other guys, even his disciples who spent three and a half years with him will come and say, what was this sermon all about? Would you please explain your sermon because we didn't get it. And I'm telling you, if Jesus were the lead pastor of Worthington Seventh-day Adventist Church, Carolyn and uh, our other elders are going to pull him by the side outside in the sanctuary, what did you mean with this sermon? Or sometimes they may even ask him, why did you upset the saints? You know? uh, this is the type of uh, sermon Jesus preached. So today... Jesus' type of sermon, so don't blame it on me. So, anyone would like to volunteer to read verses 36 to 39? We have already uh, Francis Obikunli, uh, she will read for us. So, let's hear the word of God. The Gospel of Luke, chap uh, chapter 5, verses 36 through 39. He told them this parable. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old windskin. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, and the wine will run out, and the wine skin will be ruined. No new wine must be poured into new wine skin, and no one after drinking old wine, wants the new, for they say the old is better. Okay, thank you. Now, Jesus' sermon. Jesus' favorite um, type of preaching was parables. He loved to preach to parables. And here he tells us one parable. How many parables? One parable. And he uses three metaphors in this parable. All these three metaphors bring the same message. So, here they are. A new patch, a patch of a new piece of clothing on an old one. The second um, metaphor is new wine in old wineskins. And the final one is uh, drinkers of uh, old aged wine do not like the new one. And in these three parables, uh, in these three uh, metaphors, Jesus was approaching his contemporaries and was explaining to them why their New Times resolutions are failing. Why they have a hard time accepting the new time resolutions that Jesus was bringing. And I would like to use this uh, sermon of Jesus and assess our own New Time resolutions and first find out why they fail and second, answer the question, how we can make them work. So let's go through these three metaphors. The first one, it's very strange to us because today when our clothes tear or something happened to them, what, what do we do? Do we patch them? No. We go to Macy, we go to Kohl's, to the other stores. I know some of you ladies are going to the fancier stores, but uh, we simple guys uh, uh, contend with Kohl's. Okay. So, uh, back in the day, though, they not only didn't have Macy, Macy's and uh, Kohl's, but it was very expensive to have clothes. As a matter of fact, a person who had two or three changes of clothes was considered filthy rich. So back then, when uh, your clothes tear, what they do, they take from another old, unused uh, clothes, 
uh, patch and they patch it on the torn one. And Jesus says here, no one in his common mind, in his common sense, will take a perfectly new piece of clothing, cut a piece from it to patch an old one. And do you know why? If you do that, Jesus says the patching job is going to be worse than the cloth was in the beginning. Because the very first time you wash this cloth, the new unwashed piece of cloth will shrink and will tear. And the patching job is going to be worse than before. And what Jesus is trying to tell his contemporaries and indirectly to us is that all of us have the tendency to do a patching job. Our new times, New Year's resolutions are patching jobs. Jesus is offering us completely new thing. He's offering us himself. Yet, like the Pharisees, like the people of his time when he came on earth, we like that good all-time religion. You know, remember the song, Give Me That all-time religion you know it's a very catchy song I love the song but the theology zero because because of that all-time religion they crucified Jesus and because of that all-time religion that we are so addicted to we do patching jobs we never allow Jesus to completely transform our lives we westerners approach Jesus in the same way we go to the mall we pick and choose we, we approach religion and Christianity in the same way we approach a smuggler's board a buffet we choose what to take and what not to take and Jesus says you either take me whole or don't cut pieces of me and patch it on your own life because if you do that the patching job is going to be worse than you were in the beginning this is why you see in the churches so many messed up people and sometimes people from outside criticize us and say people outside who do not know Jesus are better off than what you are doing guys there are some cases of that and it is fulfillment of what Jesus said if you take me and cut pieces of me and patch on your old, old life the tear is going to be worse than before it is better for you to have never known Jesus than to do this patching job. And friends, this is the same attitude we have toward our New Year's resolutions. Our New Year's resolutions is bettering our old self. And Jesus says, it is not going to work. Our New Year's resolutions fail because Jesus is not into a patching job. Jesus is into completely creating new Then the second uh, metaphor of Jesus brings the same point around. Back in the days, people didn't have bottles. They didn't have these glass bottles. They either stored liquids in big jars, or if they want to travel and have a liquid with them, uh, they usually will use animal skin, usually goat or um, sheep skin. And what happens is, Jesus says, you cannot pour new wine into the old wine skins because the old wine skins are shriveled they have lost their elasticity and when you pour new wine new fresh grape juice into the uh, uh, gold skin what happens is uh, there is a reaction that happens there and produces carbon dioxide and the skin gets stretched and stretched and stretched. If it's a new one, it can stretch. The old one, though, has lost its elasticity and bursts. So Jesus says, I'm this new wine. And you cannot pour me in into the old you. It's going to burst you. You cannot contain my blessings. You cannot contain me if you pour me into the old you. This is what our friends, the Jewish people of uh, Jesus' time, tried to do. They tried to pour Jesus' religion into the old 
container and Jesus says it's going to burst you Jesus is telling us your old mind is not elastic enough to contain my kingdom it's going to burst you to pieces and the blessings of the kingdom are going to be spilled on the ground Jesus says you need a new mind stretchable because the way I do religion will stretch you to the brink of your understanding the way I do my things will be criticized by others and misunderstood by many if you think that Jesus has changed over the last uh, 2,000 years you're wrong Jesus upset all the people in his time with the way he was doing religion this is wh why he ended up on the cross not because he was complying to the old good time religion our new times resolutions fail because they're just that resolutions Jesus says resolutions are not enough with me you have to, to make a new year's revolution you have to let me make a new you in order to pour into you the new blessings otherwise the old mind is gonna burst you cannot put God's new year's blessings into the old you Jesus says I have to create you anew and the last metaphor that Jesus used is the one that uh, many people misunderstand but if you read it in this context it's clear what Jesus means he says and none of you after drinking old aged wine wants the new for you say the old is better does Jesus say the old is better you say the old is better many are comfortable with that good old time religion many are comfortable to be the same person they've been before many are comfortable to pet the same sins that they have cherished in 2017 in 2016 in 2015 and maybe 10 or 15 or 20 years ago perverted taste cannot appreciate the new wine that Jesus gives many are comfortable with that all time Jesus was crucified by old timers Jesus was crucified by the people who were living in the past of the old time religion New Year's resolutions and opportunity are oftentimes crucified because we like the old wine more than the new we are addicted to our sinful taste and the things that God is offering us are blunt and not tasty and we have to allow him to change our tastes to change uh, our attitudes to completely transform our desires we all crave a happy new year let's make a reality check friends do you really crave a happy new year in reality what we are desiring is a patch job in reality what we are desiring is for God to pour his blessings into the old me the old you in reality what we desire is the old wine not the new what more oftentimes people imagine when they say that they are praying for their new resolutions is they want to change the circumstances of their life they want to change their car their house their spouse and sometimes are doing it several times during their lifetime we want to change our job some some of us want to change our kids but the reality is that none of these things even if, if they happen can bring you the lasting happiness that Jesus talks about 
the only way to experience a happy new year is to allow Jesus to re revolutionize our spiritual lives to change our tastes to change our desires to change our perspectives of values of life to make a new you to make a new me I would like to give you some ideas for New Year's resolutions that I believe will last. Two months ago, Pastor Jeremy and I presented to you uh, a study of more than uh, six months together with a group of uh, leaders in our church. And we decided to figure out what is the vision of God for the church. And we discovered that the vision of God for the church is based on five core values. First is passionate spirituality. Only people who love God supremely above everything else and anyone else can really experience the dream of God. The second core value we uh, discovered was service. That we are called not just to chase our own personal goals and resolutions. We are there to help someone else achieve theirs. Uh, we discovered that central to the dream of God for this world is discipleship. That if we want to be faithful to what God is calling us to be, we have to mentor other people into becoming sons and daughters of God. The fourth value that uh, is the one that upset the Pharisees and the contemporaries of Jesus, the one that upsets even today people is grace. Grace is this outrageous thing that turns religious people mad when you extend it to people that they, don't, that they think they don't deserve it. And they forget that they themselves do not deserve grace. And finally, the last but not least um, important core value was legacy. That Jesus has called us as people of God to give this legacy we have inherited from him to our children and to our grandchildren. We put passionate spirituality as number one in this list of core values because this is the value that can revolutionize your personal life and can revolutionize our church. People with half-baked spirituality, with patch job spirituality, are worse than having, it, having not at all knowledge of Christ. Jesus says, I want you completely new. Allow me to make you new. Don't resist me. I know that you cannot do it on your own. But don't resist me. Make the, the, the resolution that you are going to love me more than anyone else. And I'm going to give you the strength to do it. I'm going to give you the strength to transform you. And I'm going to do something that you cannot even imagine in your life. And through you, I'm going to transform the community. I'm going to transform your children. I'm going to transform your grandchildren. I'm going to transform even your enemies. So friends, 360 days lay ahead of us. We are given, given a new year. And before you take it for granted, I've been at too many funerals in the last year. To many people, this opportunity of a new year has been denied. But it is, it is given us. Let us not waste it. Let us become the new us that God desires us to be. So today, I don't want to wish you a happy new year. I would like to, to wish you a happy new you, a happy new me. May God bless us all to dream big with God and to not be content with the patching job that we have been doing for so long. Would you please take out of your bulletin the yellow connection card? I would like us to make a few practical decisions uh, before we continue with our communion. First, dear Lord, help me to begin a revolution in my own life. Let this new year be the beginning of a new me, more passionate about you and your kingdom. Second, I will use the beginning of this new year to set some godly 
goals and to pray, plan, and chase them till I reach them. And finally, in this new year, I will help our church to become the beacon of hope that God has called it to be. May God bless us all in our New Year's revolutions and in becoming the new you, the new me. I would like to invite you before we transition to the communion to sing our communion song, which is uh, 258, and it's baptize us anew, baptize us anew. 257, uh, 258. Let's stand together. <clears throat> Baptize us anew with the power from on high. With love, O oh, refresh us, dear Savior, draw nigh. We humbly beseech thee. Lord Jesus, we pray with love and the Spirit baptize us today. Unworthy we cry, unholy we <clears throat> cleanse us from sin's guilty stain. We humbly beseech thee, Lord Jesus, we pray, with love and the Spirit, baptize us today. O heavenly dove, descend from on high, we plead thy rich blessings, in mercy draw nigh, we humbly beseech thee, Lord Jesus, we pray, with love and the Spirit, baptize us today. Oh, list to glad voice, from heaven it came, thou my beloved, well pleased I am. We praise thee, we bless thee, dear Lamb that was slain. We laud and adore thee. Amen and amen. In the beginning of this service, I would like to invite uh, our deacons uh, to stay on both sides. And I would like to invite uh, uh, Elder Shuley and uh, Pastor Jeremy Wong to join us here. And they are going to offer the prayer for the grape juice and for the bread. Please bow your heads for prayer as Pastor Jeremy and uh, Elder Kevin Shuley pray for us. Father in heaven, we come before you today, Lord, thanking you for what the emblems that sit before us represent. It represents, Lord, that you came and died and sacrificed for us so that we may have eternal life. Lord, may the purpose and the meaning of this ceremony be forefront in our minds this morning. And Father, we ask that you will fill us with your spirit anew and that you will change and transform all of us and not just part of us this year. Yes. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together on this Sabbath day and that we can celebrate communion together. Help us remember these emblems of the bread and the grape juice for the blood and your body that was broken for us. I pray in your name. Amen. Amen. I want to make a quick announcement how uh, we are going to proceed. For the sake of brevity, uh, I would like to invite you to take the central aisle and to come down the central aisle, pick both elements, 
and use then the side aisles to, uh, to go to your seats. Those who are upstairs, you don't have to come downstairs. Someone is going to come up to you. Those of you who cannot, for some reason, come up front, just lift up your hand and the deacons are going to come to you to serve you where you are. We are doing this for the sake of brevity again. I would like to emphasize that. We are not doing it for any other reasons. Don't spread rumors. Uh, so I would like to invite you now to stand up and start coming up front. Pick both elements. Don't participate in them till everybody is served. And at the, at the end, we are going to take them together as a symbol of our unity in Christ. We begin this new year with a communion as a reminder that every past needs a pardon, that every present, present needs a purpose, and that every future needs a hope. The communion table is a solemn reminder of God's dream for his church. A dream of community hungry for intimacy with God. A dream of a place where God and his kingdom come first. A dream of a people who transform the world through their passionate spirituality. At the communion table, we are reminded of God's dream for his people. A dream of people whose serving has become a conduit of God's love for a broken humanity. A dream of serving to the lost, the poor, the sick, the forgotten, the unloved, the bound, the bruised, the lonely, and the unholy. A dream of a community of believers where serving provides hope to this hopeless world. Communion is a reminder of Jesus' dream for his church. A dream of a disciple makers. A dream of people who make space in their lives, not just for themselves, but for others to mentor them, to support them, and to teach them how to love, how to be loved, how to serve, and how to be served. Discipleship is a dream of God for a place where the, the Bible is cherished as the Word of God and clearly expounded to others in order to introduce them to Jesus. Communion is a place of grace. A dream of a church where people feel safe to laugh, to cry, and to be real. A dream of a church that has become a depository of God's grace for people of all places, of all classes, of all colors, of all ethnicities, of all abilities and all disabilities, of all political persuasions and lack thereof. The church is a dream place of God for broken people who are welcomed, a place where people dare to dream big and to grow tall with God's grace. Communion is a reminder of the dream of God. A dream of parents and grandparents, of uncles and aunts who care to give their passionate spirituality and devotion to the next generation and to grow them into men and women of God.
Is there anyone who wanted to participate in the communion but for some reason has not received the elements? On the night in which our Lord and Savior was betrayed, the Savior, knowing what's ahead of him, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body that is going to be given for you. In the same manner, with a gaze stretched toward the uh, ages and looking toward the ultimate New Year's celebration, our Lord lifted up the cup full of grape juice and said, Take and drink. This is the blood of the new covenant. For I am telling you the truth. I will not drink of the fruit of the vine till that day when I am going to drink it new with you in my kingdom. You have uh, cup holders in front of you. You can leave the um, empty cups. I would like to invite you to stand up on your feet before our closing song, to stand up on your feet. And you have on the screen our vision statement as a church the dream that God has shared with us about the future of our church, about our purpose, and about our New Year's resolutions. So I would like to invite you to read them together with me. Ready? Go. In the Worthington Seventh-day Adventist Church, we have vowed to become a treasury of God's grace, a place where people are safe to love, to cry, and to be real. Here we have embraced the mission of Jesus to love God, serve others, disciple all, and mentor the young. We have pledged to give a lasting spiritual legacy to the next generation, signed and sealed through our own passionate spirituality. In our church, we believe that no one should walk the path of life alone and that love can write our stories. We are the church, the body of Christ, the hope for this world. Right. 
bribe and race. With your feast you feed us, with your light now lead us. Unite us as one in this life that we share. Then may all the living with praise and thanksgiving give honor to Christ and his name that we bear. Would you please bow your heads for the benediction and repeat after me. O Lord of new beginnings, thank you for the gift of another year. For this new year, I ask you, Lord, to bless me with a renewed mind. I don't want to make unrealistic promises. And yet, I don't want to be fruitless either. Give me the strength to set some godly goals. Help me to develop a plan for their achievement. And then to keep on working on them daily. Till I bring fruit for your glory. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.